2017 was a hell of a year for the First Amendment. Nowhere was more central to this culture war than the campuses and universities across America, including right here at the University of Nevada, Reno. Two UNR students became infamous for their speech in the past year, found themselves embroiled in two of the biggest free speech controversies of the, of the past couple of years. Student Peter Satanovich became the face of white nationalism when a picture of him snarling, holding a tiki torch at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville went viral. On the complete opposite end of the political spectrum, if you can call it that, graduate Colin Kaepernick went on to the NFL and used his position to highlight police brutality and racial injustice by taking a knee during the national anthem. Both men became incredibly controversial for their speech. There were calls and campaigns for both men to be expelled for their opinions. But regardless of whether you believe with one, agree with one of them or both of them or neither, the First Amendment protects both of those men and their opinions from censorship and retaliation by the government. That's a good thing, and I want to tell you why. It's becoming more common for me to hear that we should have lower protections for speech, that specifically we should criminalize hate speech. I hear this from the left a lot. I think a lot of progressives envision a world where people like Colin Kaepernick can take a knee in protest of racial injustice without fear of retaliation from the government, without fear that the president will pressure the NFL to fire him. But they also want to live in a world where a government school like UNR can expel a student like Peter Sotanovich for his hateful views. That is a fantasy, and more than that, it's dangerous. I'm a progressive. It's not hard for me to pick between white nationalism and racial justice. One is abhorrent. One is an overdue demand for equal rights. But what would happen if I gave the government the right to decide which of those men was too hateful to speak? President Trump is a pretty useful barometer. He called the marchers at Charlottesville very fine people while reserving his ire for black football players who take a knee as sons of bitches. Your hate speech may not be the government's idea of hate speech. I sure as hell know it's not mine. But even if you happen to agree with Trump, can you be confident that the next president, the next government, will agree with your worldview? You shouldn't be. That's why, above all, I am an anti-authoritarian. I know that the US government has a long history of wielding its raw power against the vulnerable communities that speak truth to that power, against those who seek to change the status quo. And because I want every student to be able to take a knee without fear of government censorship, I am a true believer in the First Amendment. But even as a First Amendment attorney, I find a lot of the common tropes and myths about the First Amendment really unsatisfying. So I want to go through three of these myths, dust them off, and hopefully in the process we'll come up with three practical rules for exercising your free speech rights powerfully and strategically. So the first one is one I suspect we all learned in kindergarten. If you remember your nursery rhymes, please feel free to join me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Does anyone as an adult actually believe this? It's it's manifestly untrue. Uh, I'm, I'm a free speech attorney precisely because I believe that words matter, right? It's ludicrous to protect free speech by denying its very power. So why do we lie to kids, <laughs> right? Why do, why do we fabricate this thing for them? Well, it's because humans of all ages can be vicious. It's just true. And when a kid is at the receiving end of injustice, a taunt, hateful language, we want that kid to be empowered, not diminished. In February, notorious troll Milo Yiannopoulos had a planned speech at UC Berkeley. Students and others in the community went nuts. There were protests, there were riots. Things were set on fire. The administration canceled his talk. In April, there was a repeat, same thing, except this time it was Ann Coulter. She was going to speak, school officials said, there's going to be riots. They canceled her talk. Those two individuals, Anne and Milo, 
man, they became martyrs. They got to take on the role of victims of liberal censorship. They went on media tours. The media ate it up. They got more attention for being silenced than they ever did for trying to peddle their actual substantive views. So I think it's helpful to think of professional provocateurs and trolls as we would those schoolyard bullies. Yeah, their words can hurt. There's no point in denying that. But the better question is how do we respond to that, right? And a troll, a provocateur, wants you to censor them, right? That's part of the goal. It feeds into their power. It gives them something else to sell. So we don't have to march to that tune. You don't have to play that role. And we can think of them like these bullies. Yeah, their words hurt, but there is also power in sass. There's power in refusing to be goaded into a fight or to play the role of censor. Don't do it. But some words wound in ways that are different from others, which brings us to myth number two. I hear this one a lot, particularly online. We all know that hate speech isn't protected by the First Amendment. Not so. As that anecdote about Trump hopefully made you think, hate speech can be in the eye of the beholder, ear of the behearer, I guess, if that's a word. In just this week in Spain, a man was arrested for the hate crime, this is real, of calling cops slackers on Facebook. Police are covered under the Spanish hate crime law. That's what criticizing your government looks like in a country without a First Amendment. But we don't have to protect speech just out of paranoia that our government will warp what we think speech and hate speech are. There's also an upshot. In the late 1960s, a KKK leader named Charles Brandenburg was arrested on criminal charges of incitement to violence for holding a KKK rally. Uh, the speech was as abhorrent, as vicious, racist as you might imagine. But the KKK's lawyers took it all the way up to the Supreme Court and they challenged this crime, said that he had a free speech right to be a KKK member. And the Supreme Court thought about it and said, you're right. Before we allow the government to punish you for your speech, it has to pass such a high bar there has to be an immediate and specific risk of actual physical violence to a real person. And this KKK rally, well, it was a group of white racists. There wasn't anyone around that they were intending to actually engage in violence against. That case in a vacuum might be tough to swallow. I think particularly if you're a person of color, but it's not the end of the story. At about the same time, a lion of the civil rights movement named Charles Evers was giving a huge speech to a gathering of NAACP supporters who had come together to boycott white-owned racist businesses that didn't allow black Americans to come into their business. And as he's giving his speech, Evers gets worked up and really passionate, and he says, I'll wring the damn neck of anybody who breaks this boycott. So what's he done, right? He's, he's fantasized about some future violence. It's hypothetical. He's not pointing at Bob there, right? So the Brandenburg case has just come out at the Supreme Court, and the NAACP's lawyers look at that and say, well, this can't be right. How can a KKK leader get a, a get-out-of-jail-free card, right? But our civil rights guy, Mr. Evers, is being sued for incitement by the same white-owned businesses that he was protesting. Mr. Evers challenged these charges too, and he went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, I guess we're constrained by that Brandenburg case to give you your free speech rights too. I want to be clear, by the way, that I don't see anything equivalent between the KKK and the NAACP. But the court is, a, is an odd place. It's a bit stripped of context in history. It's a kind of bastion of privilege. And all they boiled it down to was, is this theoretical future violence? Or is there an immediate and specific risk of harm to a real person? And they said, well, from that point of view, these look the same. Now, I know a lot of people are skeptical that in practice, the rights that are extended to people like a KKK leader actually trickle down to somebody like an NAACP leader. They're not wrong to be skeptical. Our country has 
always taken a while to distribute its rights equally among its citizenry, right? Think of the right to vote. Did we all get it at the same time, regardless of sex, regardless of race? Absolutely not. Or even in today's world, do you think your constitutional rights at arrest look the same, regardless of your race? Your right to carry a gun? Do you think that looks the same, whether you're black or you're white? Again, no. But is the answer to eliminate or lessen the very constitutional protections that allow us to hold the government accountable when it violates our rights? Hell no. Instead, making sure that constitutional rights are evenly distributed is a process, right? And it's our job. The First Amendment is no different, right? So when the Supreme Court, when the powers that be give that right to somebody like Brandenburg, a KKK leader, it's our job civil rights leaders, those who believe in equal rights and justice, to ratchet everybody up to that same level of protection for constitutional rights. And that's precisely what the NAACP did. And that's all of our job, too. That's what I do as a free speech attorney. And that's what you need to do as students. You need to make sure that these theoretical rules filter down on the ground. So are students up for it? That brings us to our third and final myth, Today's students are just snowflakes. I hear it all the time. Usually meant as an insult, by the way, as beautiful as snowflakes are. So because of the First Amendment, public schools and universities cannot ban people from, hate, from campus simply because their views are hateful. So that means that over the past year, Black and Jewish students have had to leave their dorm rooms and walk to class passing by people who have called for their extermination. It means that women students have had to walk by speakers on campus who call feminism a cancer. LGBT students have had to walk by people saying transgenderism is a medical disorder, right? No adult has to go to work and walk by people saying they're less than human or that they shouldn't exist. I don't think students are snowflakes. I think they're badasses because they bear the brunt of that First Amendment on campus where these professional provocateurs come, right? Now, when I say that silencing your political opponents isn't the answer, it's not because I think that's weak. It's because I think it's unstrategic. So if silencing your enemies isn't an answer, what does empowerment look like in the First Amendment? Well, sometimes it's just sheer numbers. The week after Charlottesville, a group of people planned a rally on Boston Common that they termed the free speech rally. They were alt-right folks, and this is a week after Charlottesville. Only a handful of the permit, marcher, the permit holders showed up, but 40,000 plus members of the Massachusetts community and from across the country engaged in a counter-protest ringing Boston Common, standing strong, right? Sending a very powerful message of resistance together. That's a blizzard of snowflakes, right? There's no weakness in that. But sometimes, just a single person will make a difference. One of my favorite stories from the last couple of years, free speech, one of my favorite free speech victories from the last few years is a, a musician uh, who was really appalled that the KKK was planning to march um, in his hometown of Charleston. And so using the tools at his disposal, he got out his sousaphone. That's one of these big brass right, instruments. Boom, boom. And he got out on the street, and he got next to the KKK, and he just oompa, 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 along with them. It's amazing. You should, you should look up the video. It's worth watching. And without saying a single word, he, he stripped these fascists bare. They couldn't even bear to go on marching. They were so humiliated. You can't keep up a straight face of fascism with a goofy tuba line behind you. It's just hard to do. So look, I believe in the First Amendment fundamentally, first and foremost, because I know it's the greatest tool we have to keep the government out of regulating the conversations that spark every change in the world. If you want to keep having conversations that change the world, you should embrace this First Amendment too, messiness and all. And even though those three myths might not be true, I hope they started to reveal a few real nuggets of truth about how we can strategically exercise our powerful First Amendment rights. Number one, know your history. Know that when rights are extended to the power and powerful and privileged, 
that it's our job to make sure that everybody benefits from those rights. Understand that the same First Amendment that first extended to a KKK member was used strategically by civil rights leaders to cover the NAACP leader as well. That's a success story, and we have to keep doing it. Number two, don't try and silence your way out of a debate. As we've seen from Free Speech Week, as we've seen from the Free Speech Rally, people trying to co-opt the term free speech just feeds them power. We can't let them do that. Free speech as a concept, its power is in its indivisibility. It's equal for the KKK leader and the NAACP leader alike, right? So don't dance to that tune. You don't have to give the provocateur the censorship she's desperately hoping that you give her. So that brings us to number three. Dance to your own tune. Figure out for yourself when you go to a counter-protest, in numbers or alone with your tuba. Figure out when you hold an alternative a more loving event across campus. Figure out when you think there are ideas that are just fundamentally unworthy of debate. And the way that you figure out how to handle these conflicts, how to handle speech that you abhor, can be a great guideline for how you handle conflict throughout the rest of your life. My name is Lee Rowland. I'm an unabashed progressive. I'm a skeptic. I'm an anti-authoritarian. For all of those reasons, I believe in a robust and indivisible First Amendment. Join me. Thank you.